so CMIR debates in public policy. This one is about the first wave of quantum technologies. The, the research is being funded by a BEI sc school grant, and it's part of the ongoing collaboration with the Kogel School of Business, uh, the American University in Washington, Washington DC. So we're very pleased that Aaron has has joined us, and also the Morella, who will also be speaking as a as an entrepreneur. So so that's great. So the, the format is that uh, Severia will start. Aaron will speak second, and then Morella, and then we have a discussant, uh, Catherine Griffiths. So we aim to get through the presentations and the discussant session by about twenty five to two, and then there'll be a Q and A. But um, Thank you, Severio, for leading on this. So off you go. Hello, everyone. I have, uh, I think, five minutes to talk about what I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 OK, so um, quickly, uh, uh, the, um, basically, the interest we start, I, I, I took the interest into quantum technology, and I invited uh, Ellen and, um, and Heron to, um, to do some research about it from, a, uh, first of all, an academic angle, and a second, uh, second point of view from a more policy angle. Uh, because I'm coming from uh, um, industry side, I had experience uh, in 2018 about discovering that quantum was not really uh, science fiction, but was actually something quite around us. Uh, and, and, and then I got involved in, into discussion around 5G and, and, quantum, and quantum networks, the, the security aspect. So it, and I got interested into that. Uh, and uh, during this uh, work externally, you say in the industry, uh, I go slowly, slowly uh, discovering this world um, and um, uh, discovering that is actually uh, not a niche area, it's not uh, uh, something on the corner developed just by uh, some specific scientists, something that involves quite deeply um, countries all over the world. In this uh, mapping, which is not uh, um, you know, a complete one, I put together um, a bit of companies in, in, in various countries uh, looking at quantum, uh, uh, on quantum technology. They, they primarily look around uh, three areas, and here I'm using the ITU classification, uh, which is uh, on the quantum network slash communications. There is the quantum sensing and metrology, so sort of uh, quantum IoT, uh, and uh, and then quantum computers and quantum computing. and um, one interesting thing that uh, uh, you you will find is, uh, and I'm sure some of the audience already know, is a, a strong presence of the government policies in, in promoting all these. And uh, in the uh, orange um, boxes, I put some of the main one. Uh, in, um, so basically, you can see all the main uh, the main players being involved into uh, into this activity. Now, with uh, Ellen and Aaron, we decided why don't we look at comparative uh, view uh, between the UK and the US. So at the beginning, we did a bit of, uh, let's see, government policies, what happened, and then we went down more on, on the entrepreneurial side. Let's look at the startup formations uh, of, uh, um, of companies in quantum technologies in the areas I mentioned before. and. Uh, <clears throat> you see there in the charts is basically uh, is the number of companies formed along, let's say between 2012, uh, actually there is something in, in, the, uh, in the US less than that, uh, until um, let's say October 2020, yeah, September, October 2020. Uh, and you see there is, a, um, there is a kind of growth in the number of startups in these two countries. And there are two points in our opinion that uh, um, highlights the importance of uh, policy initiatives. The first one here in the UK probably, uh, someone could argue has been the first country to have uh, a, a quantum policy initiative, 2013-14. Uh, and then we have uh, in the green box uh, a sort of uh, revamping of the um, of the policies in, in various directions. And one of the direction these policies uh, have embraced is more around commercialization of this technology and therefore startup formation. Some argument could be, and one of the argument is that probably was not strong enough. 
and, and probably uh, one of the next steps we should do to have a major focus on entrepreneurship. But this is kind of the aim of, uh, of the research I'll tell you uh, later. Uh, then we said, okay, let's see which is the role of um, what happened in the two capitals. Um, and uh, also to give, uh, uh, if you want, a, a regional system of innovation view into, the, into this. And uh, two capitals are very active. There are three main reasons uh, in terms of uh, uh, opening or launching uh, startups uh, into the, in, in London and Washington. Um, you are close to policymakers, and that uh, really highlights the importance of policymakers in pushing all this. Uh, there are quite a few university research centers in, involved in the programs. Uh, if you see the UK programs, looks at various hubs. These various hubs are located in various universities. Some of them are in London. And in quite a few cases, I would say more in the Washington side, uh, the government is a client. Uh, and uh, particularly the defense sector becomes a client. And this reminds you a bit uh, how the internet came about. And maybe uh, you could think, OK, there is some similarity there. Um, uh, Sorry. Yes. The next point it was okay. Let's. Um, I'll give you some other some other indicators. So we basically try to uh, map um, to profile uh, these startups. Yeah. Mm. And uh, one one way was like see at the money uh, at the at the funded at the funds raised by these companies. And you see here the difference between Washington and London. Probably the main difference there. Uh, and again, this is work in progress. Um, need to be. Uh, uh, need to be reinforced is the presence of private investors and uh, also uh, um, another point is the presence in the US of big tech companies involving uh, their work uh, quite deeply quite deeply in in quantum technologies but this is more or less the estimate of the uh, of the uh, number uh, the money raised by those companies um which is the profile and here we are uh, Okay, I try to profile it. This may be uh, uh, re require a bit more of work. This part is mainly a micro, small enterprise. When I say micro, either less than 10 people or small, uh, around 25, 50, less than 50 uh, employees. Uh, source of funds in Washington uh, are a mix of government private in, in, in London. They seem mainly uh, government led. Uh, the areas of, uh, of work is mm, around security communications. Even there is a lot about computers computing. Um, the security communications uh, uh, appears to be a bit more uh, marketable, if you allow me this term. But <clears throat> Well, there are some companies in the US, for example, working a lot around 5G, beyond 5G uh, activities. Um, the market visibility of market presence, uh, there are companies that have offices abroad in Washington. They have already in the, uh, the large kind of um, port customer portfolio. You can find some sort of case studies on what they have done. Um, uh, they have collaboration also with uh, large companies involving in quantum, a bit less in London of this. So uh, somehow we can say that uh, the Washington side is slightly more market developed, if you want. Uh, support networks. Um, here in the UK, we have uh, the National Quantum Computing Center. Uh, instead, uh, in Washington, I mean, there are two organizations. One is the Quantum Industry Coalition, and the other one is Quantum Economic Development Consortium. In both these organizations, uh, in, both, in both cities, uh, there are um, instruments, tools for entrepreneurship. Uh, challenges, and this is more for me discussing in a very informal way with uh, entrepreneurs in, in, in quantum. In, uh, um, in Washington, they're talking a lot about funding, uh, but the London community, if you want, talks a lot about funding, yes, but also the ability to have uh, uh, support in strategy mentoring, marketing activities. The argument is I'm good in quantum, I don't know anything else about business development, so I need the help there. Uh, we have low cost in patents and uh, mm, around uh, 20 patents in Washington. Uh, uh, um, so far in London, I found some a couple of pending one, uh, but it's an area of uh, uh, work in progress. Um, 
Uh, there is another big issue, and this is one of the reasons also to have Mirella with us, is that there is a gender issue. Um, uh, 114 executive and board members are working in, in these companies in London and Washington. There are only 13 uh, women, and there are three female founders, one in Washington, two in London, one is Mirella. Um, there is probably a diversity issue. I put question marks because we have not uh, addressed that too. So um, now, uh, what we are trying to do do. Uh, uh, we, short, we sort of have a first wave of entrepreneurship in quantum, we can say that. Um, the, 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 the things we want to do in this research to understand how to drive the second wave or to empower the existing wave uh, and um, move, it, move in the life of these startups. Um, and we have discussed a lot about, uh, okay, probably the government policies have to have a more entrepreneurial focus, more commercialization focus, uh, stronger than in the past. Uh, how do we uh, involve the investors? There is the involvement of the investor, but maybe not at the level uh, we uh, we want. Uh, we need to initiatives around uh, mentoring, coaching, incubating, accelerating. Uh, there are some stuff already, but probably it's not enough. Um, also, the, the cross nations uh, and public-private collaboration is important one. Most of you probably know uh, that Rigetti Computing is working here in London for the first UK uh, quantum computer. This is an interesting story. Do we want more of that to promote uh, more uh, entrepreneurship through collaboration? Um, and also, I think this is more me. Eh? Uh, uh, that to, uh, at the moment, on emerging technology, on, on tech, the debate is really around 5G and AI, how this thing is changing everything. Maybe we should bring quantum into it because it contributes a lot. And how can we learn from the past? Yeah. And um, so these are all items that I would like you to discuss or to write your idea on the chart uh, while I'll pass the, uh, the word to Ellen. Thank you. I think thank, that was good. thank you very much, Saverio. That's that's great summary. Thank you. Hi, Aaron. Hey. So uh, my slides are loaded, and uh, I need to. Uh, you want me to put it on? To start it, yeah. What what do I have to do? I think you're, hey, you're yeah. on. Yeah. All right. And uh, good. All right. I think I think we're good. So hello everybody. It's good to be here. I'm visiting you from the other side of the pond. I'm at uh, the Kogut School of Business at American University. It's uh, nice to be with you all. And Severo, thank you for leading us and taking us into the world of quantum. It's it's uh, Severo's curiosity that that got us the three of us into this. I want to take you um, into uh, primarily the, the time dimension of this in terms of how long all this is taking. So it's very much focused on the timeline and, and uh, the uh, wisdom that we get from looking at quantum as just another emerging technology, which it is. And at the end, I'll mention something about US government support from here, from Washington. So the overall picture is to be patient with this. Uh, quantum, maybe we can date it almost a century ago to the, the dawn of quantum mechanics, the Einstein, Bohr, and Born and Heisenberg. Um, but then we, um, we jump forward almost to the end of the 20th century um, to, um, in order to, to put together a quantum computer, uh, there were was, was still challenges, and it's Shor's algorithm that, uh, which dealt with uh, factorization of polyno polynomial which um, allowed the thinking of uh, the architecture of a quantum computing computer. And notice that that happened at uh, Shore at the time was at Bell Labs, which is a, a, a big tech company of uh, their R&D center. At the time it was AT&T and Bell Labs is no longer with us. Then we have a jump of almost 20 years um, until the commercial activities really uptick. And I'll show you that in the next slide. Now, there, were, there was activity in, the, in that 20 years, but the, the really noticeable one, the one that got us into this research, uh, happened, it began just a few years ago. And, and uh, developments are really um, bunched up, uh, important developments in the commercialization and, and technology are really bunched up in the last few years. We have, uh, in 2019, we have IBM's unveiling of its first commercial computer. 
I think you can see if I'm scribbling here, right? Um, at uh, 20 qubits, um, and they're not selling the hardware, they're just selling the service, kind of like uh, accessing the cloud. And then the same year, Google claimed um, quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy is when a quantum computer does a computation that is basically infeasible in the traditional architecture that we all use every day, which is the, the zero one binary. <clears throat> so that only happened very, very recently. This is a wonderful chart that's, that complements what Severo just talked about, which is the commercialization of quantum. This came out of the, the journal Nature. And what the, the, over, the most important thing I want you to see here is this, that um, there's been a, a big jump in deals in the last few years, beginning in about 2016. You see that in 2017, we have 278 deals. And so uh, this is a, bit, a big change in this technology. We also see here that the, the span of the types of deals also span a, a larger spectrum. These are the five types of quantum technologies, instrumentation, communication, computing, computing software, and sensors. And we see um, a more diversity across the five types here. Ah. Um, Collaborate does, uh, does some butchering of my slides, so uh, bear with me here. Everything is an S-curve and adoption and diffusion is what it says here. Um, now, the S-curve is very important for us to understand the timeline of quantum. Uh, that, there's the time dimension over here on the Y dimension is, the, um, is either performance or adoption or both. So quantum is just another emerging technology, and every emerging technology uh, travels along this S-curve. Some S-curves are very steep, some of them are flat. Um, and this inflection point is, is critical here because at this inflection point, this is where um, things really begin to pick up, as you can see here, the growth curve. In quantum, we're still very much in the embryonic stage. In order to think about this some more, um, here's five uh, technologies from a, a range of uh, areas. And uh, in what you see here is how many decades it took to commercialize these technologies. So for example, um, from the point of invention to the point of commercialization for cars, it was over 20 years. Uh, solar photovoltaic um, is more than almost 40 years uh, from invention to commercialization. Now, with quantum, I'm not sure what the point of uh, invention uh, can be pointed to, but in any case, the overall picture is that it takes decades to commercialize. Another way to look at quantum is to look at uh, the famous Gardner hype curve, what Gardner did about 30 years ago. A little bit tongue-in-cheek is to um, create a hype curve. All technologies go through a buzz at the beginning, excitement, and, uh, and they rise up this curve very, very quickly. And then uh, when they don't live up to the excitement, the buzz, the hype, um, they crash. Now, they don't really crash, but uh, the excitement goes away. So look where they put quantum here. They put quantum now, right now at the very peak of the hype curve uh, in 2020 on the co computer infrastructure uh, hype curve. And that means that uh, we're likely to see, we're quite likely to see in the next few years, a little bit of the excitement of quantum going away until we begin to see um, productivity and commercialization at a, at a broader scale. Um, here's the involvement of the state, which I think that Severo already covered. So I want to move on and I want to thank you for joining and I will hand it over. Thank you, Aaron. That's, that's, that's terrific. Um, the, um, Great information that I've not seen before, so that's really good. So thank you. I will hand over to Morella now. Hi. Hi. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. Um, okay. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, but hopefully that's not affecting you. A little bit of uh, audio back. Um, okay, so if, if there's anything wrong, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to uh, tweak parameters. So thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to be part of this discussion. My name is Morella Colliver. 
I'm the CEO of Quantopticon. Uh, Quantopticon is a um, high-tech high um, firm that is operating in the realm of quantum technologies. And today I'm going to uh, basically tell you a little bit about my entrepreneurial experience as a, as a quantum tech um, uh, entrepreneur. And uh, I'm going to speak, uh, just as a disclaimer, I'm going to speak in my personal capacity and I'm, I will not necessarily uh, reflect the views of Quantopticon. So to give you a bit of a flavor about, about um, my, uh, my experience, my education and my career up to the point where I, um, uh, um, I fully dedicated myself to Quantopticon and started working full time as a CEO, um, I um, come from a, a background of physics. I, I completed my Master of Science degree in physics in 2008, whereupon I decided to do a Master of Research and a PhD um, in the life sciences. So I, I crossed over um, disciplines a bit. Um, I did my uh, PhD on a very interesting uh, protein called Sonic Hedgehog. Um, and as part of my PhD, I had to build, uh, where I, I built, um, uh, a specialized um, microscope with a very high resolution uh, based on a technique uh, called super resolution imaging that received, whose inventors received the Nobel Prize in 2014. So I built uh, the first of its kind, uh, the first of its kind super resolution microscope in Imperial College. Um, I then on to, uh, went on to do a little stint um, as a research fellow at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg in Germany. And then I continued building bespoke microscopes um, for biomedical applications, um, first at the University of Oxford and then in uh, King's College London um, uh, in my capacity as a postdoctoral research scientist. Um, and I left my position in 2019 to um, work full time on Quantopticon. So um, a little introduction uh, to, to, from a technical side on the quantum world, obviously Saveria and Aaron did a very good job of um, uh, introducing uh, quantum, but uh, from, a, from a technical and scientific point of view, uh, we, we already live in a world revolutionized by quantum mechanics. Um, Virtually all of the electronic devices that surround us um, are based on components called transistors that operate on the principles of quantum mechanics. And we are actually on the verge um, of a new um, quantum revolution that is going to sweep the world and um, enable us to make uh, even more exciting technologies that will completely revolution our, uh, re revolutionize our lives. Um, and we'll bring in some amazing advantages. Um, we, we all need innovations in order to solve, uh, to solve the pressing problems of today. And uh, the second quantum revolution will enable us to build quantum computers that will be able to discover new drugs and vaccines. Um, it will enable the building of ultra sensitive sensors that could um, prevent floods and um, save us from environmental calamities. Um, and build um, ultra secure communications channels that will allow us to transmit information that cannot be intercepted by criminals and cannot be stolen. So all of these um, quantum components um, uh, for these technologies that are currently actively being developed right now. Um, uh, there's a lot of activity around the world uh, on this. Um, unfortunately, the design and optimization of quantum components is a very onerous process and it relies on multiple complex experiments, um, uh, which essentially consist of um, making a, hazarding a guess as to what is a good design, uh, building that uh, into a prototype, testing it, finding out that it's not quite what's desired, and then repeating the cycle many, many times until the, uh, the the manufacturer arrives at um, uh, a component that actually meets the specs and the, and is high a high performance component. So what my company actually does is uh, do away with this expensive process and uh, 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 basically um, substitute it with uh, simulations um, and uh, uh, simulate um, simulate the device in silico and uh, say. Uh, and, and determine exactly what parameters will, uh, what the parameters need to be in order to yield a, um, a high-performing component. So it removes the expensive um, 
time consuming uh, and onerous experiments and labor intensive experiments um, out of the process. And it, it essentially allows manufacturers to bring their components faster to market. So this is what the user interface of uh, our software looks like. Uh, it's called Quantillion. And we have uh, two patents pending on the um, underlying theoretical algorithm that it's based on. Now, um, I founded the company in 2017 together with uh, Dr. Gabby Slavcheva. Uh, Gabby Slavcheva is um, a renowned theoretical physicist uh, who specializes in quantum and condensed matter theory. Um, she is, uh, I'm very proud to say that she's actually also my mother and is an in incredible um, role model. So I'm very lucky to be able to work with her and to have such a mother. Um, so she uh, she's the one who conceived and developed the theoretical model uh, that uh, is incredibly powerful in predicting um, the quantum phenomena that go, go on in these devices with incredible precision. Um, she developed the model over something like 15 years. Um, and in 2016, I got involved in, uh, in the development of Quintillion myself when I uh, further expanded her theory and uh, made it um, uh, applicable to quantum systems of a much broader range, hence um, widening the application of the software to many different problems. And um, I implemented the theory into code, and now that's uh, an essential part of Quantillion. Um, this is a little uh, timeline of the evolution of Quantopticon since its inception. Uh, Quantopticon was incorporated in February 2017, which makes it now four years old. Um, a, few, uh, a few months down the line, we won an Innovate UK grant, um, quite a large one together with our collaborators from the universities of Cambridge and Oxford, as well as the Tyndall National Institute of Ireland. Um, this grant was instrumental in helping us to build a user interface, a user-friendly graphical user interface for the software. And uh, further down the line in 2019, we, um, we teamed up with the University of Edinburgh who helped us to accelerate the code, uh, which was taking a very long time to a compute so a single simulation was taking something like a month to run before they got involved and they brought it down to something more sensible like a couple of days and uh, a few uh, a little bit later on i joined uh, the king's 20 accelerator which is run by king's college london um, and i have been part of it ever since um, and in November 2020, we, um, we um, managed to finish our um, minimum viable product and launched it at the um, UK National Quantum Technologies Showcase. Now, I would like to um, mention a few, of the, um, uh, a few of the factors during my entrepreneurial journey that really helped me along and helped my company. Um, I have to say, um, the uh, Innovate UK quantum specific funding calls have been extremely helpful. And uh, as I mentioned before, we, we managed to win an Innovate UK grant, which was um, really crucial for, for, getting, uh, for getting our product to market. Um, another really useful uh, organization has been the Quantum Technology Enterprise Center, QTEC, which is based at the University of Bristol. Um, there is a specific program that was run by the Centre um, until very recently called the Enterprise Fellowship. Uh, this is a one-year one year program of mentoring, training and events for quantum entrepreneurs um, that includes um, a £30,000 salary package and uh, a travel and consumables budget to so the value of £12,500, which is a, a, an incredible deal. Um, unfortunately, I found out recently that this had been discontinued um, and I was very sad to hear about that uh, as I think it's a, a great uh, opportunity for leveling, um, for um, enabling um, an equitable environment for entrepreneurs of different socio-economic backgrounds. Um, it, it's not uh, hard to imagine that if you have a lot of money, then it's much easier to fund your company and to get ahead and progress and make your company successful. Um, so having this, um, 
having the salary uh, uh, as, as, a, as a means of, um, uh, you know, um, having an, a, a secure income while you're building a company is, um, is a great, uh, great idea. And I would really like to see this um, fellowship returning to the University of Bristol. And I, I must say, I didn't actually, um, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to avail myself of this fellowship because it was at the wrong moment for me. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a great idea. Um, another um, government initiative that has been really helpful for Quantopticon has been the UK National Quantum Technology Showcase. Um, the, this, is, um, this is an annual event um, that, um, uh, that showcases the uh, products and services of the quantum technology community in the UK. Um, until last year, it was um, uh, restricted to within the UK, uh, but since um, uh, because of the pandemic situation and going online, the organizers last year decided to uh, to open it up to participants outside the UK, which has been absolutely great for us. It's it's provided a lot of visi visibility, exposure. Um, it has um, helped us to identify potential customers, um, get in touch with a lot of people, um, and uh, have uh, have an actual. Uh, we we could have a we we had a virtual booth where we represented our software, and it was uh, it was ideal. Uh, it was an ideal uh, uh, marketing um, exercise for us. Um, and uh, of course, the King's 20 Accelerator has been incredibly helpful. Being part of a, um, an entrepreneurial community is always great, even if uh, the other ventures uh, in the Accelerator have nothing to do with quantum technologies, but you can get support in various interesting ways, um, in, in other ways apart from the scientific matter. Um, scientific and technological matter. Uh, the accelerator has been great also because it provided us with small grants um, and they, uh, we uh, won one of the awards, uh, cash awards that enabled us to really um, uh, carry out the final step in, um, uh, in finalizing our user interface. Uh, and yes, w without it, we would not have been able to finish our uh, minimum viable product. Um, the accelerator are also great and they, they provide um, uh, expert advice from seasoned um, serial entrepreneurs who are very savvy in their project in their uh, in their um, in their area of expertise and uh, there are uh, for, there are experts who specialize in different areas and there's for example, software specialists um, who are incredibly helpful in working out how to commercialize our products and how to market it and how to attract attention from the right people. Um, so these, these are the main factors that we have encountered uh, that have been extremely helpful in uh, furthering Quantopticon. And now I'm going to mention some of the less advantageous ones um, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but um, I'm conscious of time. Um, okay. how, how much longer will you need? Uh, it's a fantastic story, but I, I'm, I'm conscious that we need to keep to time. Okay, um, I, I, I can be very quick. I can just uh, finish with this slide. Well, maybe another three minutes. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, um, okay. So I would, I'll just quickly uh, go through these. Um, uh, Basically, all of the quantum calls were cut this year, um, and as a result, we had to apply for the open round um, of the Innovate UK, uh, competing with all businesses. Um, so we didn't actually manage to secure any funding this year. Uh, we also find that um, Innovate UK paying uh, grants quarterly in arrears uh, can be uh, 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 very difficult in terms of um, managing cash flow in the company. Um, also, uh, requiring SMEs to, to find 30% of matched funding from their total project costs is difficult. I think this is a, quite a, a large amount of money uh, for SMEs who are usually bootstrapping and uh, generally don't have access to, to large loans because of, the, because of their lack of assets, so they can't secure a loan against it. 
Um, and by comparison, I wanted to mention that uh, the uh, quantum flagship, which is the European um, Quantum Technologies uh, funding program, uh, actually gives a 100% grant. Uh, gives a 100% grant to SMEs um, and it, it pays them in two installments, once at the, the beginning of the project and once in the middle, which is a better funding scheme, funding model in my, in my opinion. I would also like to say that there is a bit of an inequality between uh, startups that are not affiliated with uh, academia and those that are spun out of academia in the sense that uh, those in academia tend to have a lot of job security because they are founded by um, senior academics who receive a regular salary uh, and don't have to worry about income problems. Um, uh, universities also have tech transfer offices which provide um, uh, assistance with commercialization, marketing and PR as well in some cases. And uh, they and university academics also have um, a, a, an army of postdocs that can do their R&D research for them. But I can, uh, there are also downsides that I can maybe discuss that in the Q and A. Um, also, uh, I I would like to point out some issues with regards to uh, there being several different technological platforms uh, for quantum technologies that are currently competing. Uh, Nobody is quite yet sure which one will prevail. Uh, but uh, the fact that there are several different ones is causing conflicts of interest in the assessment of Innovate UK proposals in that uh, rivals, um, uh, some, some adherents to one specific school of thought will shoot down proposals from, uh, from their rivals. And this is not an ideal situation. And I think Innovate UK needs to think about that. Um, and uh, yes, and another uh, Innovate UK requirement uh, that seems um, current at the moment is that is the requirement of uh, lining up investors to jump in straight at the end of projects, um, uh, which is not ideal for all businesses. For example, in, in my case, um, because we're a software business, we don't really need a huge injection of cash um, and regular seed rounds. So this is not the best model for me. Um, and I have some data that I would like to show maybe at the Q&A. Um, and finally, I just want to say a couple of words about um, the fact that I still find it quite difficult uh, to, to run and grow a quantum startup despite hundreds of millions of pounds being uh, invested by in the, into the National Quantum Technologies Programme and the fact that I think um, the government needs to think about how to level the playground um, so that uh, people don't fall through the gaps and all talent is leveraged and um, uh, being uh, being recognized um, so that we could build um, a world leading, oh, so we, we, so we can make sure that the UK is world leading superpower in quantum technologies. And uh, one way to do this is to collect more data on the type of businesses that receive public funding and also on diversity data. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Uh, well, well, thank you. And that, that's a great way to end is looking at some of the things that have worked and some of the things that are problems as a, um, for us as researchers, you, you've given us fantastic things to, to think about. So we're going to turn over to Catherine now. Um, what, what I'd like when Catherine's talking is for you, if you have any questions to put them in the chat and then we can deal with them when uh, Catherine has uh, done her comments. But thank you, Morella. That was fantastic. Okay, okay well, Catherine. Uh, Thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you very much for three different but complementary uh, sort of views on quantum computing. I think um, I was asked to really look at some of the, or, or just comment on the sort of policy implications for entrepreneurs and startups and in this field of quantum computing. I think the first um, point I'd like to make is um, it's quite difficult at the moment to really grasp what is quantum computing in the sense that it on the one hand it could veer towards being science fiction as Severio started out by pointing to and on the other hand it is actually what is it that's real because um, at the moment it's only seemingly uh, Google that has done anything that is truly quantum in a, an absolute sense that's peer recognized to some degree and nevertheless 
as um, Severio's uh, slide shows, uh, there's a worldwide fascination and a huge amount of money being pushed into this area, both from governments and from very large companies. And I think to get to the um, end, end uh, outcome of a true quantum computer uh, is going to take absolutely monumental amounts of um, funding in order to crack some of these very, very uh, intractable problems. But as one of the early um, uh, sort of uh, people in this field has said, the fact that Google has even got as far as it's got to shows that it's not impossible, but it's just very hard. So I think in terms of looking at the policy and the process for helping to both encourage and nurture this industry, um, there are several things that strike me as need to be needing to be done. One is uh, to look at how the internet itself was allowed to develop and become a significant force and a global force that then spawned other industries and other uh, businesses. Because the way that has grown up, it's even now a titanic battle is going on, as we've seen with Australia and Facebook, in who has control of it and who taxes it. So I think in looking at some of these issues, um, that the small entrepreneurs, because they will ostensibly be small, even if they're within very large companies focusing on um, uh, quantum, they, how are they going to manage and can they address some of these issues preemptively almost in order to allow um, them to be given the leeway and justify the funding that they obviously so much need in order to progress. And one of the areas perhaps is um, to focus on um, how can we have a network of like interconnected responsibilities that are distributed across various groups of stakeholders and not all on um, the sh shoulders of scientists or the entrepreneurs themselves, but how can partnerships with social scientists help us to understand how science and society interact and how can specialists act as facilitators with enough technical knowledge to um, really initiate and then husband these collaborations. And I think that where the problems are, as I see them, and this is a new field to me as well, is that um, principally the air areas of risk, who is taking the risk and who is actually being responsible as a result, and um, security and privacy, because a lot of this money is coming from governments, because they can realise the potential of what quantum computing might do for cryptography and data that they hold and we've only had to see what's happened with say um uh with uh snowden and then the panama papers and then one or two other in the financial field what happens when data gets out which has ostensibly followed all the criteria but actually there's almost an insidious um, message within that data that those companies, those governments wanted to hold on to it. So I think these are very big issues where the policy needs to almost um, develop in line with both the potential of what quantum could offer, but also in, in line with what the small entrepreneurial groups are starting to be able to do. Because even when we look at the internet itself and um, the founders of the internet are themselves worried about the fact that they don't want it to be um, uh, colonized so that parts of it become inaccessible or there are too many barriers to us all having access to it. As a society, we don't actually want quantum computing, I would suggest, to be totally the exclusive um, hold of either individual governments or individual companies who can't be controlled or held accountable or um, share the outcomes of what they uh, produce in order to enable so much more to happen and so much more entrepreneurship to follow on from that. So um, I think some ways to um, uh, address this might be along the lines of what is different about quantum computing and where are the similarities with other breakthrough technologies in the past 
that we have now got to a level where we feel quite comfortable with them at some levels. So I think what, how, how was the internet itself released and then enabled and then supported? And um, can we learn from that? And then how can we match, map that on to where there's good practice and good findings, map that on to the embryonic nature of uh, quantum computing at this very early stage. And within that, hopefully, there could be the uh, fertile territory for entrepreneurs to blossom and therefore to actually help um, entrepreneurs like you uh, who are actually really wanting to do things. And on the one hand, you're saying you don't need the finance, but on the other, you actually do need some of the barriers removed. But I'd suggest you also do need the finance because this is evolving. And what you want to do is have some streams of finance that not that are not so much stop and start uh, as these over here have been. And I think possibly one of the reasons why they might have stopped some of these programs might be that they are not clear what quantum can do. And with Google and others sort of making these categoric statements of, well, we've done it. Oh, no, you haven't. What you did in two seconds, we can do in a week. Um, but it's, it's not two seconds, but actually we've done it nevertheless. And we can do it now, whereas you can't um, uh, sort of navigate your technology beyond that single thing that you've cracked. We can actually spread our technology and do much more than just that, but it might take a week and not two seconds. So I think there are some issues there. That need to thank, come thank you very much, Catherine. That, that's great. We haven't got any questions in the, the chat. So what I, um, oh, Connor, would you like to ask a question? Yes, please, sorry. It's just, I've got a few and I didn't wanna, type it because it was just going to take forever and I thought it'd be easier. To <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you. I'm a business student so I can't pretend to understand the science behind all of this but I've, I've tuned in for the uh, for the innovation part so to tie in with uh, what I learned about innovation and how that syncs with our economy um, and then what, uh, what Morella said about uh, Quantilium speeding up the process of the development cycle of the, of the application, taking it to commercialization. I just wondered if she um, had any insights into how, how effective that was at um, speeding along that process, um, whether there's any uh, predictions of when that might come, it might now be like, implemented in terms of like, commercialization. And if, you have a, and if she has a vision for what that might look like when it is brought into mass production and it's used commercially. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take that question uh, since it's addressed to me. Um, so uh, we we are still at the early stage of um, commercialization, at the, the right time of commercialization, as it were. Um, we uh, So our customers are manu manufacturers of hardware components for quantum optical technologies. Um, and uh, they are still in, still kind of working out uh, how to make these components, and uh, they don't have a an established, uh, you know, they they don't have a, they have a plan about how to make them, but they haven't actually really uh, got to to the stage where are confident in making them, and we are just getting involved now with this process, so um, we are really at the beginning of actually uh, commercializing our software and, and getting customers to, to pay for it, essentially. Um, I think uh, my vision for the software is to become something like um, uh, something called um, electronic design um, automation software uh, and CAD software or computer aided design software that is currently used in the semiconductor technology and is used for making um, it, it's it's used massively in the semiconductor industry to to make integrated circuits and um, all sorts of other electronic components. Um, so we want to do the same. We want to be that kind of uh, uh, enabling software, except for quantum technologies. Um, and uh, yeah, this is uh, this is still yet this is still to come. Um, essentially, we're we're at the beginning. Thank okay. You. 
Um, okay. Yeah. Do you have any more questions? You said you had uh, oh, additional uh, questions. Just on. one more actually. It was about um, have you any trouble with um, get uh, with the patent? Because I know that in the past, software has particularly had issues in that area. Legal. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, it's difficult to patent the software itself, uh, it, but it's possible to patent the algorithm, which is essentially what we've done. Um, and uh, yeah, we needed to be careful about what wording we used. Uh, but so far, uh, it's it, it's working, and it's it's a lot easier to patent software in the US uh, apparently, which is the next step we're going to do. So at the moment, we've just patented, we've uh, filed a patent in the UK, and we've filed a, a PCT patent, which is um, sort of an inter international patent, which will then be converted into uh, a patent in individual countries around the world. And one of the ones we're targeting is the US, of course, because a lot of our market will be there. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Karina, and then I think Catherine wants to speak. But we'll finish at uh, two minutes past one, so we've got another six minutes. So, uh, Karina, would you uh, maybe Morelli, you, you just answer you, um, Karina's question in the chat? Can you can you see? Okay, I'll just open the chat now. It just says, what sorts of problems quantum computers proved to be very good for so far? Where and uh, where didn't they work? Uh, well, quantum computers are really not at the stage to address any um, um, uh, useful problems at this stage. Um, so, uh, yeah, at, at this point, at this point, they're not very useful. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, quantum computing is a technology that will be ready in about. 10 years time, or this is a projection. Uh, this is the this is one of the quantum technologies that is going to take the longest to bear fruit, as it were. There are other things like quantum sensors and quantum communications that will become a reality much sooner. But yeah, for quantum computers, we we have to wait a few more years before they're they're really making a contribution. <laughs> OK, and the, and the other question, which I think is important uh, as, as business students, have you seen any exits of small quantum technologies? Because we know uh, quantum companies, because yeah. it's usual pattern of shakeout. Yeah, um, I, I'm not aware of any, uh, to be honest. And I, I would be very surprised if they were, because um, they are just starting to develop their technology. Um, and I mean, a lot of the quantum companies out there are not really making a revenue at the moment anyway. So um, yeah, we're, we're far from that. Yeah. I, I think there have been some acquisitions in the States, a couple of acquisitions. But mm, I think two, I found the two acquisitions in the States. Uh, okay. From uh, you know, a bi the big, uh, big players uh, buying uh, two small small companies well that, i think that's a pattern to watch catherine did you want to come in again yes uh, yes thank you Helen. i was going to say actually um uh, that i i think that um with the process and the policy of um developing innovation in this field um with quite a number of smaller companies that actually do a breakthrough in a very specific area their main way of getting to the marketplace is to be bought in a trade sale almost or sucked up into a bigger company whereby that can be um, uh, optimized, that growth can be optimized fairly quickly. And I think that that is quite often the way that uh, very successful innovations start to get to the marketplace because actually the timing is very critical in being a breakthrough uh, first. So I think one of the issues might be whether one is uh, a breakthrough first company or a fast follower, as it's be, become called, in, in order to get into the marketplace once the threshold has been broken. Uh, I don't know if it's very different in the States and perhaps um, uh, others would like to comment on that. Um. Can I uh, just a final comment? Uh, I mean, I obviously, I agree with Mirella. Mirella is the expert here, but quantum computers are far away. But you know, what I've seen on on the on the 5G beyond 5G communication side, um, so the secure communication aspects, which was one of the objective Mirella put in the slide, 
we are not that far. I mean, uh, I, I attended a couple of meetings in which there were a couple of presentations about the use of quantum and secure communication. And, you know, I appreciate the, 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 the revolutionary value and probably is the area more, uh, more marketable at the moment, probably the, the one closer to, to, to market, yes, in which you can see a lot of activities there, a lot of companies working around, uh, not, there are quite a few companies doing, also small companies, I'm not talking about the big ones. So maybe we need different stages. Maybe we need to catch the moment of this 5G story that is touching us at the moment a lot from a policy level, implementation level, and maybe raise the bar, raise the bar of quantum there. So showing that you know there is, there is there is something there, real. It's not just in the hands of people like uh, of Mirel. So I think there is a lot of discourse to do. I mean, a lot of narrative to put in place. I think it's very exciting. Erin, would you like to have a final comment on this, on the session? Is he there? Okay. Um, I think <laughs> well, thank, thank you, uh, everybody, for attending. And thank you for excellent presentations. And thank you for excellent discussion, Catherine. It, we could have gone on for another hour. I would have liked to have had the end of Morella's presentation, but uh, I'm sure you will share uh, the slides with us. And it, it is it is it is brilliant area to be in. And congratulations to your mum and say well well done on her work and uh, bringing up such a clever daughter. So it's so what a family. So thank you, thank you, Erin, for thank your you presentation. Much. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you. We'll we'll stop there.